Uh, thank you, Rada, for the invitation. Uh, I'm not actually part of this workshop. We're doing the parallel workshop on the other side. So we're the guys needing all the food in the queue ahead of you. Um, apologies for that. Um, we also had a longer lunch break, so we've treated our attendees much better than you. But um, that being said, uh, it seems like a really interesting workshop. Just, just came in for the last 20 minutes and a lot of relevant work. Uh, so, so let me just introduce uh, Synopsys and, and the context here. Um, so Synopsys uh, has been uh, working in the, for the last two, three years on an embedded vision processor for low cost, low power, low area applications. And by that, I'm looking at you know, two, three millimeters square, 100 milliwatts uh, in 28 nanometer HPM. So a very different category from a GP GPU that you know, some of the presentations we've just heard are in a different space. Um, so we're looking at uh, video surveillance, uh, ADAS, uh, and, and a range of applications. Um, some of you may have come by our booth, so you have some idea. And, and I won't be doing a, a spiel today about our, our product. Uh, we'll talk about the experience of using OpenVX. So we've been um, uh, looking at, at OpenVX for uh, about a year and a half now. We had one of the first uh, certified uh, implementations on, of OpenVX on our EV5 processor family. Um, so I'll be talking today really about the Graph Manager and the features of Graph Manager, um, and mostly you know, lessons learned through a real example. And I, as I said, I promise I won't try to sell you anything. On the contrary, just tell you about what works in OpenVX and what are the things that need to be improved for the future. So really constructive look of, uh, at OpenVX. Now clearly we're a proponent of OpenVX and, and we support it, but of course it's not perfect. Try to highlight some of the directions we think that would be useful. So just, uh, I think everyone in this room knows about the concept of graphs and OpenVX graphs. So underneath here is a very simple view of uh, our first generation embedded vision processor, which has a quad core uh, risk processor combined with a vision accelerator. In this case, it's a specific CNN, uh, optimized convolution neural network accelerator uh, that is a uh, very low power, very low area. Um, the two communicate through shared memory with DMA, explicit memory management for data movement on and off chip. So of course the, the graph mapping problem is, is taking these different nodes uh, and the runtime will be optimally assigning different nodes to parallel resources on an underlying heterogeneous platform. So it's homogeneous on this side with you know, quad core risk and heterogeneous in terms of the two different processing subsystems. So challenge number one, in this space of a couple of millimeters square and 100 milliwatts, you often don't have the power budget or area budget for a host processor. So it's really important to have a solution uh, where the system is self-contained and self-hosting. So we have the option to work with a host, but we also have the option that the full OpenVX API runs on the vision processor. And that's a nice quality and characteristic of OpenVX that it can be self-hosting. And we definitely do that. So that avoids the cost of a host processor running Linux. Second challenge, we're talking a couple of millimeters square, 100 milliwatts, very aggressive requirements. So clearly we've, we've had to do a lot of work in deeply optimizing the runtime in the graph manager to make use of the available data memories. So we have an architecture that has a combination of data closely coupled memories attached to each processor core. We have a multi-bank uh, shared memory with low latency access and, and uh, full arbitration. Uh, we have uh, L1 coherent caches uh, for those parts of the application that requires caches. And we have, of course, an external memory. And all data movement can be either through cache coherency or through DMA. So there's a lot of different ways to move data and to synchronize and communicate between this heterogeneous multi-core system. So it's extremely important that your OpenVX runtime factors all of this in and optimizes for this. Um, another important uh, element is that we do automatic mapping, but automatic mapping is sometimes great, sometimes not so great. So you do need that um, backup solution or, or um, uh, user-guided solution to drive the node to core assignments. I think the same question was asked about GPU, CPU. We have the same type of use the OpenVX hints mechanism to force a given node on a given processing resource. Uh, we also have uh, ability to give hints 
on the data buffer placement. So as I mentioned, we have an architecture of a rich heterogeneous a memory architecture to keep memory low, memory power low and memory area low of closely coupled memory and explicitly managed memory combined with L1 data caches. So you want a way to, we do this automatically based on certain heuristics, but the, cu the customer and the programmer can guide this through uh, OpenVX hints. And however, that guidance is just at the level of a hint. It is this data I would like to reside in a DCCM. The actual how that is managed and the implication of that, if the data is on a DCCM and then you communicate the result to another processor on a different DCCM, then the runtime will take care of either the posted writes or DMA based, based on the size of the data. So there's a lot of automation behind these hints. The hints are just about high level classes. Is it cached? Is it in DCCM? Or is it an on-chip shared memory? Or do I want to force it to be off-chip and then they will do DMA or cache coherency to pull data in? Uh, we also have uh, provisions for scheduler hints to guide these, the scheduling and ordering of events. Finally, of course, the graph manager will support pipeline graph execution, both uh, coarse grain and uh, tiling based. So graph mapping is about um, taking the different nodes uh, that come from, and the kernels can come from either the standard uh, 41 functions from the standard library can come from user kernels and can come from Synopsys or other vendor kernels. And uh, that's the different colors here. Now, one of those vendor kernels is a CNN. And that will be running on the CNN engine. But all the other kernels will be running on the general purpose processors here. So uh, UI runs on the first processor. UJ runs on the, sec the same processor. While KN is a standard kernel that, in this case, was load balanced on the second processor. Now, of course, as a programmer, you don't want to think about this. You simply want to define your high-level data flow using the OpenVX graph and internal to that kernel using C, C++, uh, and in the future, OpenCLC. And we presented yesterday our, some of our work in OpenCLC, so alignment with what I've just heard in the two last presentations. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that we're all kind of going in the same direction. But for today, uh, for this current, uh, current uh, generation platform, we're using C and C++. Um, and uh, so yes, so, th so this standard kernel is running on the second core. Now that means that you just want to think about the high-level data flow. And if the data is, is residing on a different processor, you want the runtime to be able to manage the communication from UI on processor one, uh, doing posted writes or do DMA-based movement, or L1 cache coherency, depending on the, the storage class you've assigned. All that is done automatically by the runtime when you go from one processor to another. Of course, you can just, by changing a hint, KN can run on the same processor. The runtime takes care of reassigning, reallocating, taking away the DMAs, everything local in the same L1 data cache or L1 uh, DCCM. So that is managed by the runtime. So those, that's kind of the, the first level. And the second level is you might have UK that talks to VM. Logically, it's all homogeneous. It's all OpenVX. It's all data flow. And of course, on this architecture, there's a sudden big jump there, because then you're going from a uh, homogeneous multi-core standard cores to very dedicated CNN engine. And so our CNN engine is, as OpenVX is designed, is uh, to be wrapped homogeneously in OpenVX. And underneath the blankets, we implement all the drivers to get data between the two subsystems, from the general purpose cores to the CNN specialized core. I think in this audience, frame-based pipeline execution, I don't need to explain. I probably could have taken that slide out. Uh, you obviously know what delay objects are for to have parallelism between two data-dependent kernels, kernel 1 and kernel 2. Now, of course, the downside of, you know, in general, a frame-based execution is you need to store the entire frame. So we've put a lot of effort. Um, well, first of all, frame-based is, 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 is sometimes needed. Um, but looking at, for example, the 41 or 43, depending on how you count it, the OpenVX kernels, about two-thirds of them are tileable. So tiling is an extremely important way to, to optimize. Now, in some cases, you can use kernel aggregation techniques. And uh, the AMD presentation, I think, is a beautiful example of that, where you can actually do that automatically and therefore reduce bandwidth and therefore not have to go off-chip, but keep, keep computations local. Some cases, L1 data caches can make sense uh, here, but that usually consumes more power. And so really, uh, the most efficient uh, approach in most cases when you can is to do tiled implementations. So uh, the concept here is you have kernel 1 talking to kernel 2. Logically, that's quite simple. A classical approach was that you would read the full frame, 
process a full result, store that in frame two. That frame two is a potentially 1080p or 4K image. It will not fit on this kind of one millimeter square budget you have for memory for these deeply embedded systems. So you'll have to store it off chip. You typically have, you know, 100 kilobytes or 500 kilobytes, but that'll rapidly be filled. Um, so that has both expense in uh, data movement, which uh, slows things down, uh, but mostly has expense in power, that you're going off chip and consuming a lot of power to write to the DRAM. So tiling is, is really an enhancement of the OpenVX runtime we worked on, uh, a special implementation. So basically you're taking a frame and you're taking a, a couple of lines of that frame, two, four, eight lines typically in, in most applications where you can tile. Um, and so you're doing a DMA, explicit man memory management, so you're not using caches here, you're keeping power low. And, and these are well-defined accesses, so you would not use cache for this type of regular uh, homogeneous access. So you use a DMA and that's automatically managed by the OpenVX runtime. You then compute uh, the results for that tile, generate the result in the second tile, mm -hmm. and when that, second, that result is available, the kernel two can start immediately on those, let's say, first four lines. And in parallel, you are then preloading the next four lines for the next tile, and then K1 can start computing the next four lines in parallel while K2 is computing the previous four lines. So you have a functional pipeline, but not a frame-based pipeline with delay elements. Here you have a functional pipeline based on a pipeline of the pixels and of these tiles. So this still produces parallelism, and the big advantage, as you've seen in comparing this implementation to this one, is you've saved this entire frame. So the entire frame two is streamed as two pixels or four, four lines, eight lines typically, uh, that are commuting through a very small memory and then passing that result to the next processor and this is streamed through. This is a very trivial example here of two kernels. If you had 10 kernels, you would save nine frames. All the intermediate frames could be saved if those, those nine kernels can be, can be tiled, of course. And as I mentioned, OpenVX as an, as an example, you know, two thirds of the kernels can be tiled. So this is a very, very useful uh, functionality. So we built this and we've kind of enhanced the runtime uh, and taken, it's specifically optimized for our architecture, of course, that makes use of DMAs, that makes of use low cost synchronization, that does uh, synchronization through semaphores and not through interrupts or, or busy polling and so on. So we get a very efficient, where basically 99% of your time in, is processing kernels and not doing data movement, which happens kind of transparently in the background as a prefetch uh, type mechanism. So the obvious challenge number four you all know is that there's 41 functions. That's growing every year, of course, and, and we've, you've announced, um, OpenVX has announced you know, a new set this year and that will continue to grow. Um, so clearly we'll be, ex we're extending the standard set with our own vendor kernels. Um, luckily Kronos is uh, upfront uh, defined. Uh, OpenVX is extensible, so that's, that's great. Um, now clearly we have to make sure that user-defined kernels can also benefit from this tiling. And that's something that still is not really standardized inside OpenVX. There's certain elements, and some of my former colleagues have, have worked on this in the past. I see Thierry in the, the back line there. And so this is an area we've been, we continue to work on, uh, and it's a really important one that user kernels can also benefit from this, uh, this uh, kernel tiling. Of course, the, the runtime needs to, su to support graphs that combine standard nodes, vendor supplied nodes, user defined nodes, all seamlessly and interoperably, and also combining tile based nodes as well as frame based nodes um, with all these different permutations of six, two times three. And of course, we uh, continue to work with OpenVX uh, and Kronos to extend the library. Uh, we're building things we think are useful, so we propose those to the, to the Kronos body. So a quick look of a, a case study and some of the lessons we've learned. So we worked on a face tracking example. Um, this is a, a, an application that detects multiple faces and tracks one specifically recognized face, identified face. Um, this is derived from the uh, tracking learning detection algorithm. Uh, uh, OpenTLD is the open source version of that. Um, now here we took that and, as an inspiration. Because we have a CNN engine, uh, we wanted both to show you know, the benefits of using CNN and also have an example that combines both general purpose processing on the risk cores as well as CNN-based processing on the CNN optimized engine. So this example replaces the PKLT uh, tracker with a CNN with a much simpler context tracker that is much more lightweight and low, lower computation requirement 
uh, than the PKLT optical flow. Um, this is what the graph looks like in terms of its block diagram. The OpenVX uh, is identical, uh, essentially. And this just shows how we've uh, combined these different functions from the grayscale to the pyramid, the integral image. Then we have a node that represents a CNN node. So that's a face detection CNN that is uh, you know, pre-developed. Pre um, and then we do non-minimum suppression, context tracker, cascade detect in parallel with the learning phase uh, in the last step. So here's the partitioning of the different uh, processing. Um, four RISC processors, and RISC-4 is doing uh, three different functions, RISC-2 and 3 doing kind of bigger functions, and RISC-1 number one doing the first three. Uh, by the way, RISC-4 um, is simply calling this, this CNN node. It's not actually executing the CNN, but that's invisible. So the, as, a, as far as a programmer, you're programming in the OpenVX world and somehow underneath the blankets, this call, the synchronization, the remote procedure call, the data movement and synchronization back, all that happens transparently uh, underneath this node. You're simply in, in, instantiating that uh, vendor supplied node. So we've, we've made a few improvements uh, along the way. Um, initially, we could have used the color convert and channel extract. So we kind of did a graph fusion and called a new RGB to Y uh, color conversion. That's just a, a basic optimization. Um, the image pyramid kernel, we, we did a more general one that handles any downscaling factor, not the, the current two limitations of the current one. Uh, we also did a, a variant of the integral image that does sum of squares rather than just uh, sum. Um, so minor stuff, but still, you know, we, we had to extend it a little bit. Of course, non-standard kernels reduces portability, so we all need to work together to all bring our experiences and, and enlarge this, this library. Uh, one thing that really was uh, really not capturable in OpenVX, and I think this is a, an, open, you know, an open topic, is, you know, sharing large global data structures. Um, so we're, here we had a face model, so we have a learning phase that is building dynamically a, a model of the face and the context around the face in order to do the tracking. Uh, and that's a pretty large structure. So we could um, capture that and pass it to all nodes explicitly as explicit data flow. That really would, in this one millimeter square, 100 milliwatt budget, this is expensive and you would be going off chip and on chip. And so we, um, you know, we had to do that outside the scope of OpenVX. Now in, in this case, because of the graph, um, basically the face model was updated here and was fed back to these two, we're able to do through the scheduling hints a you know, race-free schedule uh, where we reread those, that data structure and cheat a little bit in OpenVX to reread that data. But because this is a simple graph, it was easy to do, it was safe to do. But in general, I think this, this idea of you know, global data structure that are shared, um, you know, do it in a way that can be scheduled without races and contention with at least some simple cases, I think, is something that we'd love to you know, discuss with Kronos in, in the future. Again, this is the deeply embedded space in, in, in larger systems. This is not as much of an issue because memory size are larger, but in our space, which is still representative of a large part of vision in the future, I think this type of problem will, will happen. Um, I'm gonna do, well, let's see if this works. Let me just see. It does, wow, okay, great, this never works. So I had planned for it not to work and we had the thing separately. I'm gonna go back to the beginning. Um, so let me stop this. Uh, it works, but it doesn't allow me to control it. Oh well. So what if I go back one slide and start over again? Okay, good. Okay, so we have two faces here. So keep in mind we have a combination of general purpose software running on our quad core CPUs and a CNN engine that is specifically doing face detection. Now, the CNN identifies all faces. It doesn't know the difference between the right face and the left face. It's it trained to recognize faces, not to recognize this face or that face. So we're, that's where we have this you know, open TLD that looks at the context. So we first uh, told the application that this is the face we want to track. So it knows that that's the face, and it starts you know, the, on the first frame, starts training and, and learning about that face, and then dynamically maintains this face model as you go through. Um, so what you'll see here is whenever you see white squares, this means the CNN has detected a face. When you see a red square that replaces the white square, that means it's the face has been tracked, recognized, and tracked. 
So we want to see that, make sure that as these two guys walk around the room and they cross each other, the red face always stays on this guy. And you'll see in this demo, they, they'll move their hand in front of their face. Uh, they'll pass behind each other, so it'll be partial occlusion. So you see, in, you know, this, this kind of works in you know, more realistic use case than just sitting there. Oh. Okay, I have to click again. Okay, so this is the face being tracked. Occasionally you'll see there's a white box that means it lost the tracking but recovered it very quickly. So no contamination here. There's still, you know, there's the context uh, was still precise enough that even as they went over each other, they didn't lose it. Doing some inclusion, you can see that the CNN still de detects and recognizes faces even though you hide it partially. They will not win an Oscar award for acting here. So you saw that it became white for a minute there, for seconds, that you know, the, the context lost it and then found it back from the face model and recovered. Okay, so just to show that this is real, this is actually running uh, on a HAPS board. This is not a simulation. This is based on the actual IP mapped onto an FPGA, uh, running at one-tenth of real time, of course, on FPGA. So we run at 50 megahertz on the board, and we just played it back 10 times faster just uh, to make it more natural. Of course, on an SOC, this would run at uh, 30 frames per second. Okay, so lessons learned, very simply, and I'll, I'll stop there. Um, lots of optimization was needed to do this, even this relatively simple example. Uh, it's all about data, play, data movement and data placement. Um, Tile-based flow data execution was, is, is important. Um, these hints are really useful. Uh, the the runtime sometimes find me optimal, but usually uh, you're, you, you can't predict everything, especially data movement and latencies of the data movement. Even though you can do profiling statically of all of these kernels of each of these nodes, and OpenVX gives you that information. But then there's, uh, the latency of data movement depends on the style of data movement, so you really do have to run this dynamically and iterate. Now OpenVX with these hints is a really nice way to do that as long as you have a fast environment. So we use the FPGA board as our kind of dynamic real-time environment, not real-time, but one-tenth of real-time, so you can really run this and do these experiments very quickly. Um, we've uh, built this runtime to support any mix of these three types of kernels, both tile and frame base. And in this case, it runs without a host, uh, so it's self-hostable, and the full OpenVX stack runs on the, the RISC processors without an OS. Um, clearly, we need to extend the standard vision kernels. We'll have to go beyond. Uh, I think there's work still in improving and generalizing the tiled approach. Uh, that's clear one d clear differentiation of OpenVX in relation to OpenCV. You know, OpenCV is based on frames. I think OpenVX, because it uh, targets low power and high efficiency, tiling is really important. Um, not all applications fit nicely in this data flow representation. We could have, you know, uh, passed the face model but it would have been expensive and unrealistic for the targets we have. So we were not able to do that. We had to cheat a little bit. In this case, it was easy to do, but in general, I think this is something that needs more study. Um, clearly, you know, you're trading off standards against performance, um, and there's a productivity, portability, performance trade-off. Uh, we've done a lot of work on this optimized runtime, and we feel that you know, this is giving us a good edge on terms of if you do this right, we are finding there's no downside to use an OpenVX within the limits that we said, that it doesn't have it yet enough kernels, and there's some exceptions, but for what it's designed for, we've, our conclusion is we get a very, very low overhead uh, that's invisible in all the applications we've done. Um, of course, we've optimized the runtime to get that, low, that overhead really low, um, and so we're, we're quite happy overall, and but we're still you know, very engaged with the OpenVX community, and we'll continue to work with you guys uh, for many years to come, I hope. Uh, we had two presentations last year. There's more details of this actual application. If those are curious on the application side, there's a longer presentation. Uh, we also have a presentation on our CNN um, uh, on last year's presentation. Uh, yesterday, there was a presentation on our OpenCLC compiler work. So that's the direction we're clearly going into. And uh, underlying that, of course, uh, you know, we're uh, building architecture of the future that will be compatible with OpenCLC. Um, so that will be on the, this year's uh, Embedded Vision Summit presentations. Um, that's about it. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Yeah. Any question about your CNN node? Is that node the topology as well as the weights? Or is it a fixed topology? 
Yeah, so this is a, a pre-trained, pre-mapped CNN node. So the CNN node represents really, here's the frame, um, and the output is the list of objects you've detected and their coordinates. It's as simple as that. So you're giving a pointer to the frame where you want to detect faces. Right, but it's, so you only have a node for face. Well, we have as many nodes as uh, CNN object classes that we support. Okay, so you, you, there's a specific set of objects that you support. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have uh, faces, pedestrians, uh, automobile, automobiles. Those are, we, in fact, we don't do that. We work with a partner, MultiCoreWare. Uh, they do the training for us, and then we port it onto our, our There's no ability to do more, more generic face. Uh, that would be easy to just define a, a generic CNN node with a parameter, which is face, dogs, kangaroos, whatever. But today we just had a face, because there's only a couple of these classes. We have one per class. So you mentioned uh, optimization regarding tiling. When does that optimization really happen? Does it happen? At what stage of the graph does this optimization So what we provide is a, um, the, the programmer defines what will be tiled um, and defines the coarseness of, of the tiling. So they're in control of the tiling. So we simply provide an API and a very efficient implementation behind that API to tile, and we tile on a per line basis um, rather than a patch based basis where you cut the line in multiple pieces uh, for the reason that the per line basis is gonna be much more efficient because you won't have the apron effects by cutting patches. So you can do patches, but that will be less efficient. And because images, uh, we have small memory size, but typically you're operating on two, four, or eight lines, even for 10, you know, 1080p, that's still a very reasonable amount of memory. So we, we, grant, we make sure that the most efficient version is the one that runs on the full line, and then you don't have to worry about apron effects. So really, the, when I say the optimization, is really the implementation of that support of the tiling API that we, we provide.